This is Glenn Robinson, President of the World Affairs Council of the Monterey Bay Area. I would like to welcome you to our newest edition of Quick Takes on International Affairs. Please enjoy this talk and do consider joining the World Affairs Council. It's a pleasure today to be able to speak to the World Affairs Council at Monterey on the topic of Afghanistan, a country that's much in the news, but much misunderstood. Well, the United States has been involved directly in Afghanistan for more than 20 years. The questions that are being asked about Afghanistan are very similar to those that were being asked in 2001. And one of the difficulties the United States has had in Afghanistan is really a refusal to take the country, its people, and its government seriously in terms of how the dynamics of Afghan politics as opposed to how the dynamics of American politics work. Much has been made of the Afghan military collapse that allowed the Taliban to seize all of Afghanistan without significant opposition, as if that were unprecedented. In fact, the last four governments in Afghanistan all collapsed in the very same way. In 2002, the Soviet-backed People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan dissolved and handed Kabul over to the Mujahideen, Islamist enemies, peaceably. In 1996, the Mujahideen government that had ousted the communists fled Kabul rather than defend it against the advancing Taliban. In 2001, Afghan allies of the United States who held only one-tenth of the country's territory and probably had fewer than 15,000 troops, routed the Taliban in less than 10 weeks, and Kabul fell to them without fighting. In August 2021, the sides reversed, but the dynamic was the same. Kabul government forces chose not to fight or cut deals with the Taliban, and the Taliban entered Kabul without any opposition to declare themselves masters of Afghanistan, a position they had held only tenuously 20 years earlier. In all of these cases, it was, the, it was a sudden outside shock that led people to believe that an existing government had no future, and they acted accordingly. In a land where the perception of power is power itself, this produces a self-fulfilling prophecy. For the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, it was the collapse of the Soviet Union and the realization that no future money or arms would be coming to Kabul that was that shock. Three months after the Soviet Union collapsed, so did its Kabul client government. For the Mujahideen, in the midst of a civil war, it was the belief that they could not stand up to a surging Taliban that caused them to abandon Kabul. For the Taliban, it was the invasion of Afghanistan by a United States prepared to back its enemies to the full that made its supporters and allies question its staying power. And today, it was the sudden withdrawal of American and NATO troops that was perceived as a vote of no confidence in the Ghani government. In all of these cases, the intoxication of an absolute victory has led to the creation of governments that believe they had no need to reconcile with their enemies. After all, if they had taken over the country so easily and their enemies had disappeared, why bother? They were in charge. They had the weapons. They were ready to employ power to impose their own ideology, ideological beliefs whether that was socialism for the PDPA or Wahhabi style Islam for the Taliban, there was no need to accommodate yourself to enemies that you had defeated. The intoxication of an absolute victory by Afghan insurgents has thus historically led to the creation of governments that think no reconciliation is needed at the end of a war. The Taliban is currently in this intoxication stage. 
But if they do not reach out more broadly, they could find themselves in the midst of a new civil war in which they could lose power just as easily as they gained it. November 2001, the American-backed Northern Alliance walked into Kabul as the Taliban fled the city without attempting to offend it. They too were intoxicated with the ease by which they had defeated Taliban forces and the rapidity at which the Taliban had abandoned the fight to go home or flee to Pakistan. It was a stunning turn of fortune for the Northern Alliance that had been on the verge of complete defeat after the assassination of their leader, Ahmed Shah Massoud, only two months earlier. Now they are in control of all of Afghanistan and presented with the daunting task of creating a stable government in a country that had lacked one since the communist coup of 1978. At that time, in 2001, many former Taliban and Taliban allies were prepared to participate in the new government. Some had switched sides or just stepped aside to make a Northern Alliance victory possible. Those Taliban who downed arms or returned to their villages sought accommodation with the new regime, if only to protect themselves and their families from reprisal. Rural power brokers, particularly from the Pashtun areas of the East and South, where the Taliban had been the strongest, were more concerned with local politics than who ruled Kabul. This would have been the time for national reconciliation. But that opportunity was foregone. Instead, the international community convened a conference in Bonn, Germany, that excluded the Taliban and overrepresented expatriates long absent from the country. It hammered out a victor's peace that made Hamid Karzai Afghanistan's leader and treated the new government's ministries as political spoils. In retrospect, it became clear that the opportunity for establishing a more inclusive Afghan government was squandered. If it was not done in Bonn, it could have been done during the first year of discussions in putting together a provisional government. Many people were interested in abandoning their former Taliban affiliations and taking part in the new government. However, the United States, under the George Bush administration, took the view, as George Bush put it, you're either with us or against us. So a Manichaean point of view of permanent friends and permanent enemies. In Afghanistan, where factions have seen the rise and fall of many different groups over the past 40 years, there was no such thing as permanent friends or permanent enemies. When situations changed, so did the people. And if one is seeking reconciliation, one does not do it in the midst of war, but at the end of war, when combatants on both sides are most interested in returning to normal life. And Afghanistan, which has suffered from so much war, is very much open to any group that can promise stability without persecution. But the question is, why was this not done? And one of the reasons was that as long as foreign troops were in Afghanistan, a Kabul government had no particular reason to have, enter into serious negotiations because it could not be overthrown as long as foreigners were there. It could afford to take a hard line. It could afford to use United States power to build a highly centralized government in a country that had historically resisted highly centralized governments. From the United States point of view, this was not a particularly important issue. But from the point of view of the Afghans, it was. And any government that had the backing of foreigners and had no belief that it needed to accommodate, not just its enemies, but as allies of different perspectives, is in a situation where it's going to push a political situation to the brink. Still, 
as long as the United States was willing to ensure the Afghan government's survival by limiting Taliban gains, the war stalemated even as the Taliban took over more and more districts. One of the things you have to realize about Afghanistan, very mountainous country, a lot of deserts, only perhaps 12% of Afghanistan is suitable for irrigated agriculture or has cities on it. So looking at the territory taken is not particularly a good marker of what a government needs to control. Or for that matter, an insurgency can control many mountaintops and many deserts and be no closer to achieving power um, than it was before it took them. That stalemate, however, ended when President Biden announced he would honor the Trump administration's agreement to withdraw all U.S. forces from Afghanistan. This had a knock-on effect. Not only would the small number of U.S. troops, perhaps 3,000, withdraw, but with them would be another 10,000 NATO troops and another 18,000 contractors that maintained the Afghan army's equipment. And with that, the capacity to do air operations and provide logistics that the Americans had backstopped the Afghan army with. The speed of withdrawal, particularly after Biden announced that he would have everybody out by September 11th and then move the schedule up so that he hoped to have them out by July and then August, um, the speed of that withdrawal made it clear to the Afghans that they were on their own. In a political culture where the perception of power is power itself, the Taliban were deemed winners and the Ashraf Ghani government losers. This is an extremely difficult position for any government in Afghanistan to reverse. But even harder if you had a president like Ashraf Ghani, who had become widely unpopular and had no ability to connect with the population, no ability to rally them to his cause. I remember in 2014, when I was talking with a, a NATO officer, asking what the military thought of the election between Ashraf Ghani and Abdullah. I said, which one do you think is more stable? And he said, Abdullah. And that surprised me because the embassy and everybody else was saying Ghani, World Bank technocrat, was just what Afghanistan was needed. And when I asked why, he said, sir, who the hell is willing to die for Ashraf Ghani? Seven years later, as Ashraf Ghani fled the country, I was aware in Afghanistan, politics and a bottom line comes down to that. No one was willing to die for Ashraf Ghani. As it turned out, not even Ashraf Ghani. The Taliban now find themselves in a position of absolute power, but they lack the tools they need to govern. To get these, they must immediately reconcile with the international community that currently funds the government and the people of urban Afghanistan who make that government work. The Taliban must also adapt themselves to an urban environment that is unfamiliar and hostile to them if they wish to avoid the emergence of a new insurgency that has its strengths in the cities rather than the rural parts of Afghanistan. For the past century, no Afghan government has been stable without foreign support. Those that lacked it or lost it never survived very long. According to World Bank figures in 2020, International aid accounted for 42.9% of Afghanistan's 19.8 billion GDP. Unlike the Soviet or American-backed governments, the Taliban lacks an international patron willing or able to finance its regime. Pakistan is bankrupt. It can't play that role. China may be willing to strike economic deals with the Taliban government but not to subsidize a regime whose Islamic beliefs are far more radical than those it is attempting to suppress in Xinjiang in Western China. The countries that supported the Taliban 
or that supported the government the Taliban has just overthrown are unlikely to provide more than humanitarian aid unless the Taliban creates a broad-based administration that includes political figures trusted by these donors. Taliban leaders have been moving in this direction in their public statements, but three weeks after taking Kabul, there is not even an outline of a Taliban government who would run it or who would be part of it. Given the Taliban's brutal history, their promises mean nothing unless translated into action. But the greatest future danger to the Taliban is the project is the prospect of uprisings in Afghanistan's cities where 75% of the population is under 25. The Kabul of 2021, with a population of 5 million people, bears little resemblance to the ruined city the Taliban ruled in the 1990s. The Taliban, masters of rural insurgency tactics, have little capacity to cope with an Afghan spring style movement. Stretched thin across the country, it lacks a centralized military command that can and can neither operate nor maintain the wealth of military equipment is captured from the old government. Officials of that government established a base of resistance in the Panjshirs that the Taliban seem to have managed to suppress. But the difficulty of holding on to power is not suppressing enemies that bear arms against you so much as standing up to people who might choose to oppose you in the future. And the problem in Afghanistan right now is that the Taliban, having won so quickly, are ill-equipped to provide even the basic services that the Afghan population expects. An Afghan population certainly would welcome security and end to a war, but no government in Kabul can survive if the people of Afghanistan begin to face starvation, if their economy begins to collapse. It is during the times of greatest success that new Afghan governments believe they can command without compromise. Over the past half century, four successive Afghan governments have made this mistake and been ousted by insurgents. Insurgents at the time of their victory appeared to be non-existent, but rose up against them over time. Whether the Taliban will be the fifth regime overthrown by a new insurgency remains to be seen, but certainly, if they wish to form a government, if they wish to bring stability to Afghanistan, which the people of Afghanistan really would like to see happen, no matter who is in charge, they need to think about doing that now. Unfortunately, if the past is prologue, we will see that they will decide they need do nothing except enforce their edicts on a population that really does not share their ideology. But the Afghanistan that they are attempting to run in 2021 is so different in terms of the world of communications with cell phones, televisions, radio stations, with international travel. It is so different that the policies that barely served to keep them in power until 2001 are unlikely to work now. But the difficulty is that ideologues, when they choose power, assume that God is on their side, at least until some other faction finds that God is on their side. Thank you very much.